For many people, Jesus coming isn't soon enough. Amen? For many people, Jesus is coming is too soon. Because if they're not ready, when he comes, it'll be too soon. But the important question that we need to settle in our own minds is, are we ready today for the soon coming of Jesus Christ? So, as we, as we continue our study of the book of Daniel, chapter 7, in the New Testament, John talks to us, as well as Paul, about the Antichrist. And that word, Antichrist, is a word we use a lot, but it's a word that's only found four times in the New Testament. And many people think of Antichrist as being at war with Christ, when in reality, the way John and Paul use that word, it means instead of or in place of Christ. So when John was in the Isle of Patmos, he began to speak to God's people about the dangers of the Antichrist. And he wrote in 1 John 2.18, Little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. So you get the picture, we're talking about two different antichrists. He said, there are many antichrists that have already come, by which we know it is the last hour. Notice 1 John 4, 3, where he says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And 4, 3 says, And this is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard, was coming and is now already in the world. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Amen. In John, 2 John 1, 7, it says, In the flesh this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So as, as you read what John is writing, you realize that there are, he's talking about two different kinds of antichrist. One is somebody who denies Christ, who denies his deity, who denies that he is the Son of God. But he says the antichrist is coming and is already in the world. Well, that can't refer to people or individuals, because people don't live that long. John said that in the spirit of it has already started in his time, and the Antichrist would continue to the end of time. You know, there are a lot of people, when you talk to them, they're still looking for the Antichrist to come. John said he's already among us, and he will be with us until Christ comes. He says, he says, the person who denies the Father and denies the Son is an Antichrist. That's one of the people he's talking about. But he says, there is an Antichrist that is coming and the spirit of it is already in the world. As Paul says, it's already in the church. That spirit of Antichrist. So we've got one who denies Christ and one that's already coming. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. No. Paul doesn't use the word antichrist, but he has the same sense of what the apostle John is writing about. Paul said, this man of sin is coming, showing himself that he is God. Standing in the place of God, in, standing in the place of Christ. 
Paul goes on to say, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive, excuse me, did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It is the lack of the love of the truth that makes us vulnerable to being deceived. Amen. Whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Seventh-day Adventist, if we do not have the love of the truth, we are open to deception. So what do we need to do? We need to love the truth, don't we? And who is the truth? Jesus. Jesus transforms us as we open our hearts to him. So Paul says that the Antichrist would come, and he's and you can read several other statements from Paul as he's counseling the leaders of the Christian church about the dangers of the coming of the Antichrist, coming within the church. So going to Daniel 7, we find Daniel praying because God has given him a vision. We're familiar with God giving Nebuchadnezzar visions, but in Daniel 7, Daniel himself receives a vision. And he's wanting to understand what God is trying to say to him. And in Daniel 7, we learn of a principle that God uses. It's called repeat and enlarge. So everything we learn in Daniel 7, we first learned in Daniel 2. So God repeats it. And Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, he repeats it, but he keeps giving us more information. So remember Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, the Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. And Daniel began to interpret it. He says, you, O king, are the head of gold. And then he talked about silver, and then brass, and then bronze. Excuse me, brass and then iron, and then the ten toes of clay and iron. <clears throat> and we began to discover the outline of the world of powers that would be coming. It's interesting that in Daniel 2, God uses an image to, that man relates to gold, silver, brass. But in Daniel 7, God uses animals that he wants us to better understand. And so Daniel begins praying, Lord, I need to understand this. So in Daniel 1, the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions of, of his head while on his bed, then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven that were stirring up the great sea. We learn from, the, from some of the Old Testament uh, prophets that the, that the Mediterranean Sea is what Daniel is referring to when he says he sees these beasts coming out of the great sea. Verse 3 says the four great beasts come up from the sea, each different from the other. So he sees the the wind blowing on the water, and the result, the four beasts came out of the sea. Isn't it amazing how God gives us all these symbols, and he tells us what the symbols mean? <clears throat> Have you ever listened to some of these preachers preach on Daniel? Some of the things that come up with are mind-boggling. And yet God systematically explains what he's trying to tell us. If we're just willing to follow his word. For instance, Revelation 17, 15, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So as Daniel sees these beasts coming out of the water, he knows that the waters represents highly populated areas. And what's interesting is, 
these beasts that come out of the water, they're not crocodiles or water buffaloes or elephants. They're land animals. God will be sure we didn't miss it. We didn't get confused. Jeremiah 25, 32 says, the, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. And they shall not be lamented or gathered or buried, that they shall become refuge on the ground. So Daniel's seeing these four beasts coming up, each one different from the other. In verse 17, it says, These great beasts, which are four, represent four kingdoms. Remember Daniel 2. <clears throat> Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the four kingdoms. In this case, they're seen as animals, as beasts. So those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And the importance of understanding of these beasts are is, is the key to understanding the Antichrist. It says the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I watched till the wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. <clears throat> we know from the symbols, we know that the Lions were very important in Babylon, and, and if, you, if you went to uh, Germany, to Berlin, to the museum there, you would see um, samples of the walls of Babylon and the imagery of lions. And so you have the king of the beast, the lion representing Babylon, and you have the wings of the eagle, the king of the air, representing the power, the majesty, and the speed in which Babylon was able to conquer the powers around it. But then he said he saw another beast. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, was raised up on one side. <coughs> Excuse me. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much. So we know that this symbol is very appropriate for the Persians because the Persian army was massive and it was slow in its, in its movement, but it was powerful. Remember the beast, the, the, the bear, one shoulder was tied on the other, representing the Medes and the Persians, and it had three ribs in its mouth. Remember what the ribs were for? Anybody remember? Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. Three nations that the Persians overwhelmed and, and conquered. But then he said, I saw this and looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and the dominion was given to it. So, who's the, who's the leopard represent? Alexander. Alexander, yes. The, the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great. The, the Persians were able to overwhelm the Babylonians with their might and their size. <clears throat> Alexander the Great armies were much smaller, but faster and more effective than the Persian armies. And he conquered the known world by the time he was in his early 30s. Unfortunately, he also died in his early 30s, and his kingdom was divided among four of his generals. And then Daniel sees this other beast. It says, after this I saw in night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. Daniel says this beast is different. And one of the significant differences of this fourth beast. We have Babylon, be the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Rome is the first world power that is a republic and has a Senate unique to all others. And it is 
There, there was no animal to describe this creature, which we know today as pagan Rome. And, and pagan Rome, after it conquered the Greeks, ruled until 476 AD, the longest ruling world power. Now, some, some skeptics say, well, you know, Daniel didn't really write this. This was written by someone probably in the second century. Well, number one, I don't agree with that conclusion, but if, let's say if it was written by someone in the second century, how did they know that Rome would be the last world power? How did they know Rome would be divided into ten kingdoms? How did they know what would come out of those ten kingdoms? God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Rome is the power that was ruling when Jesus was born. Rome was the power that was ruling when Caesar Augustus sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. Jesus was tried by a Roman court. It was a Roman soldier who put a crown of thorns on his head, and it was a Roman soldier that thrust a spear through his side. Rome ruled longer than any of the other kingdoms prior to it. Daniel 7.24 says the ten horns are the ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom. And there was an amazing phenomenon that took place as the ten tribes that the Romans had, had used as their allies and who had also abused significantly, these ten tribes returned against the Romans and began to destroy the Holy Roman Empire. And so we end up with all these different nations, the Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. Remember there were ten. There are three, the Hurliar, the Vandals, and the Orthogos. Those three don't exist. Those are three that were not on the same page with the church. He says, I was considering the horns, and there was one, another horn, a little one coming up among, the, among before whom the three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So, what does this tell us? It's, you know, it's interesting that God spends more time talking to us about this little horn than he does all the other powers. He spends more time identifying the little horn than all the other powers. And so it's important for us to understand who the little horn power is. So we're going to go to Daniel 7.25 and outline the identifying marks of the little horn power. So the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Number two, another shall arise after them. Three, he shall be different from the first ones. Four, he shall subdue three kings. Five, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Six, he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And seven, he shall think to change times and laws. And lastly, that the saints shall be given to his hands for a time, times, and half a time. Now, there are a lot of people out there in the world, and even some within the Adventist church, who try to tell you, well, this is who I think this is, like Antioch's Epiphanies. And they try to come up with different answers as to who the Antichrist is. Some like to use 666. Did you know that, uh, Ray, did you know that someone figured out that you can get 666 out of Ella White's name? It's ridiculous. So people come up with all kinds of answers. But the correct answer is you have to fit all eight of these qualities. Yes. There, there can't be six or four or five. They have to be all eight qualities. Amen. So we'll review it again. From among the ten horns, arise after them in 476 AD. They'll be different. They'll subdue three kings. They'll speak pompous words. They'll persecute the saints. They'll think to change times and laws. And they'll rule for time, times, and half a time. So why does Jesus give us this information? Why does he share all this with us? 
Well, well, before I get to that, let's time, times, and half times. Remember, one of the keys we need to look at is Ezra 4 6. I have laid you a day for each year. So, what does a day in prophecy mean? A year. A year. That's what, what the Bible tells us. The number is 1434, according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days. For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Now, the Bible is using the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar has 360 days. So times, which is two years, 720 days, half a time or half a year, 180 days, gives us how many days? 1260 days or 1260 years. So he says, so do three kings. Emperor Zeno and Justinian eliminated the early eye in 493. And then the Vandals in 534, and finally the Ostrogoths in 538 AD. That date sound familiar? After the Ostrogoths were overthrown, the Bishop of Rome was established. In, in, in 538 AD, they begin their power. Which takes us. 1260 years from 538 to takes us to 1798. Anybody know what happened in 1798? Yeah. French. Yeah, yeah, the French Revolution, birth year, it comes in and arrests the Pope. Before you know it, there are three popes. It's kind of like you cut a tree down, a bunch of branches come up. You know? Isn't it amazing how God knows what's going to happen? He gets it right 100% of the time. So why does Jesus give us this? Why does he give us all these clues, all this information? He says, and now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may, you may what? You may believe. He prophesied that there would be the Babylonian Empire, both in chapter 2 and in chapter 7. He prophesied that there would be the Medo-Persian Empire, both in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. He prophesied about the Greek Empire in Daniel 2 and 7. And the Iron Monarchy of Rome in both Daniel 2 and both Daniel 7. And the Ten Toes or the division of the Roman Empire. Isn't it amazing how accurate God is? Yes. Yes. So we have the little horn power from 538 to 1798. So see how God has taken Daniel 2. He's repeated that information in Daniel 7, but he has now enlarged his information to us. Because what we need to know is why is it so important? Well, Daniel 7, 8, God talks about the little horn. Daniel 7, 20 and 21, he gives us more information about the little horn. Daniel 7, 24 and 25, he again stresses the little horn. So do you think Daniel 7 is about the little horn? It's a trick question. Yeah. It's not about the little horn. God is preparing us for the war that's coming. But it's the judgment that he's talking about. The heart of Daniel 7, which is the heart of the, the book of Daniel, is that yes, all this deception is going to happen. And be careful that you're not deceived. The judgment is coming. And God wants us to be ready. He talks about the little horn each time it's followed about a discussion on the judgment. You find in the judgment of Daniel 7, 9 through 12, Daniel 7, 22, Daniel 7, 26. And he talks about his new kingdom. Daniel 13, 14, Daniel 7, 22, and Daniel 7, 27. So when he talks about the little horn power, don't be deceived, he talks about the judgment. The only way we can be saved is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he talks about his kingdom, that he is coming. 
Don't let anybody deceive you that it's not going to happen. There are many who say, well, we've heard it, we've heard it, we've heard it. Jesus says, don't be deceived because it is coming. So we have a little horn power. And we have two choices. Two choices. Christ or the Antichrist. And we might say, well, we're self the Adventists. We would never be deceived. <laughs> Remember, John and Paul are both talking to the church about not being deceived. They're not talking to atheists and agnostics. They're talking to Seventh-day Adventists and saying, be, be forewarned that you be not deceived. Because Satan is, he's pretty cunning. I have several friends who are no longer Seventh-day Adventists. He got caught on all different kinds of tangents. Because they got deceived. And they believed that deception so strongly it left the church. Some were lay people, some were pastors. They said, I can no longer in good conscience be a Seventh-day Adventist. Because they were deceived. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Satan is a liar and the father of it. He longs to deceive us. And the choice is yours. Second Thessalonians, Paul said, the only way not to be deceived is to live the truth. And Jesus is the truth. Yeah. Is to be in love with Jesus and to allow Jesus to transform us and to be in love with his word. Now, someone did a study several years ago that the average Christian spends seven minutes every week in the word. Jesus. Seven God. minutes. Can you imagine? Have mercy. Yes, have mercy. And they spend about that much time in prayer. Have mercy. How much time does it take you to pray? over your meal, which is about what most Christians spend their time doing, including Seventh-day Adventists. If we're not spending time with God, how can we be protected from deception? Right. And the reception is so cunning. It looks so much like the truth. It's, it is the truth with a little bit of error in it. It's like drinking Grape juice with a little bit of arsenic. <laughs> that right? You're familiar with that story? Jim Jones and his grape juice. It looks good. I guess it was cool, you know, grape juice. Grape juice was too expensive, probably. And so unless we're drinking from a fountain of life, we'll find ourselves drinking the Kool-Aid. We'll find ourselves a seed. We'll find ourselves outside of the church. Is the church perfect? No. no. But are you perfect? No. Uh, who is perfect? God. Yeah. Jesus and his word. You hear stories ever so often of people who jump off the boat. Well, you know, the boat's not perfect. But it's going to get us there. Hey. Noah wasn't perfect. His kids weren't perfect. But if they'd gotten outside of the ark, they would have drowned. Amen. We need to stay in the ark. Because Amen. Amen. God plans to see this through to the end. So, Jesus is coming. And I leave you that same question. Are you ready? Are you ready for 